Eli stared at Thrawn, thinking back to the campfire stories of his childhood. The tales had spoken of Chiss' unity and military prowess. Never once had the stories talked about them exiling one another. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to cover every bit of lore on the Chiss species in both canon and legends. When something is mutually exclusive, I will put a legends or canon tab on screen if you care about that distinction. A lot of the detail will come from this most famous of Chiss, but we also get plenty of accounts from other species who interacted with the mysterious blue-skinned outsiders. And by the end, you'll see just how important the Chiss species are to the entire galaxy, in effect being the people that keep the demons of the deep from emerging, from breaking the surface, breaking out of the unknown regions to the parts of the galaxy we're more familiar with. How they are the leaders of this sort of parallel dimension, only coming through to spy on other civilizations, and hoping to work with the Emperor in his fight against an ancient evil that Lord Sidious himself had only caught glimpses of, but which he knew was far greater in power. As you'll see in this video, the Chiss are all about absorbing as much information as possible in the most efficient manner, which is the whole idea behind this video's sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist focuses on the big concepts of books, providing you with both a text and audio summary that packs all of that info into around 15 minutes making sure you get all of the interesting and important takeaways. Think back to some non-fiction books you've read in the past. If you're honest, you might not remember a whole lot. Definitely not a chapter-by-chapter -chapter breakdown with the key ideas and actionable advice. For example, a while back I read The 48 Laws of Power, one of the most recommended business books out there, but I don't remember all 48, maybe a handful. And so I'm currently using Blinkist to review this book, and there are tons of books on here that I've been meaning to get to. Classics like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and newer books like Atomic Habits. Blinkist is amazing for business and personal development, but there's a ton of other categories like science, history, and biographies. Thousands of books you can absorb in a quicker, more efficient manner. A healthier and smarter way to fill up lost time doing chores or sitting in traffic. Just imagine how productive you'll feel starting off 2021 doing a workout and listening to a Blinkist summary. By using our link in the description, Blinkist.com slash MetaNerds, you'll get 25% off. Use your 7-day free trial to explore some titles you've been meaning to get to, and you can cancel anytime you want. When you find out you love it, it'll be one of the best ways to invest just over 6 bucks a month, an investment in your curiosity and self-improvement. Thank you Blinkist for supporting this video, and may all you MetaNerds out there have a productive, interesting, and engaging 2021. But let's get back to the mysterious Chess people. To start this tale, we need to go back to around 100,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, when the Celestials were designing the galaxy. The Celestials, beings like the father, son, and daughter found on Mortis, once manipulated everything from the placement of stars and planets to the creation of new species, planting them across the galaxy and even constructing enormous craft for various roles over the ages. Most Coruscanti researchers believe that the Celestials created the human race either on Coruscant or that they were moved to this world at some later date. Though some theories believe that they were created by the Rakata, there's more pointing to the Celestials, simply for the fact that they are the true original masters of the galaxy. And even though the Rakata made a bunch of humanoid species like the Zabrak or Twi'lek, this human shape was there first, and is seen in countless species across the galaxy, linked to their shared creator in the form of Celestials. Now, genetic studies done by both Imperial scientists and those within the Chiss Ascendancy show that they are genetically very similar to humans. They concluded from this that the Chiss were the long-lost evolutionary cousins of humans. But it's also the possibility that they were created by the Celestials separately. That perhaps this shared genetic code may point to the Celestials working from a base code template. Something like you might do with a computer code for a website or video game. Reworking some elements for this new project but not building a completely new code from scratch. Why this distinction matters is because of how the Celestials disappeared from the galaxy. You see, their mastery did not just extend to matter, but even into a multiverse. The only Celestials we ever see are on Mortis, which is not in our dimension. As we saw during the Clone Wars, two ships could appear to be in the same spot in the normal galaxy, but the Jedi had been pulled into this other dimension with the Celestials. We're at the rendezvous point awaiting your arrival. Where are you? Sir, we are at the rendezvous point, and there's no sign of you in our scanners. Oh, come on. That's impossible. In the Celestial Civilization's Golden Age, they came into contact with an interdimensional being known as the Nal Nal. Accounts from this come to us from a being known to the Chiss as Waru, another interdimensional organism that may have come from the same original dimension, 
as both were Grey Ooze shape-shifting creatures that were bent on consuming life. Waru just wanted to use his unique connection with something akin to the Force to get back to his home dimension. But Nal Nal was like a plague, a virus that could not be stopped despite the best efforts by the masters and architects of the stars. They decided that their only option was to cut off its spread, to collapse areas of space-time, and make hyperlanes to this area impossible. For a hyperlane to be useful, it had to extend for thousands of light-years at a time, just one light-year being around 6 trillion miles. So by creating a scattering of anomalies, it became like a maze, or space-time thicket, that, if not entirely impossible to traverse, would make it unbelievably difficult, only with a preposterous level of effort or luck. This worked to save the galaxy that we know, while resulting in this bisection that would forever sentence this third of the map to be referred to simply as the Unknown Regions. Remember, though they may have been a species created separately by the Celestials, the Chiss believed themselves to be descendants of humans that had been trapped in wild space. And there was a human sleeper ship that was lost in this area around 27,500 BBY. Though it's unclear if these became the colonists on the world Scylla, which at that time was a lush tropical world. But this planet's migration through space put it into an ice age, compounding the trials for these people. They were now cut off from the galaxy at large and freezing. Luckily, these were a high-tech, spacefaring people, and they were able to move underground to survive, evading the quick growth of glaciers and snowstorms, while they plotted to branch out and build an empire. Despite the difficulties, or perhaps because of them, this world would remain their center of their civilization. And it was this living underground for tens of thousands of years that resulted in the change in their skin color and eyes. Their blue skin was due to minerals in the glaciers that now became their main source of drinking water. While the hue of the blue in their skin was dependent on the level of oxygen that they were exposed to over their lives. Almost all had this blue-black hair, but there were a few that had gray hair, something that was believed to be a sign that you will have exceptional children. While one of the most useful adaptations were their enhanced hearing and vision. They could hear a slightly greater range of sounds than most humans, but their vision had evolved to let them see in the infrared range, something that could show them how parts of a person's face were heating up in conversations. Coming to learn how one's face would light up when they were lying, angry, scared, or calm. Just another non-verbal cue to pick up on in conversations, often giving them an advantage over humans. And they would grow to be a bit taller than your average human, at 1.85 meters or about 6 feet, and live just a bit longer as well, with an average lifespan of 80 years. The Chiss are known for their cool-headed, stoic, and tactical nature, which is a result of both biological and cultural factors. Biologically, they mature at about twice the rate of humans. A 10-year-old Chiss was as mature as a 20-year-old man, and so the demeanor of a 40-year-old would be comparable to a wise old sage in human societies. Though a major shortcoming was their connection to the Force. There were a few Chiss Force users in the form of Jedi and others, but notably only on this side of the galaxy. In the Unknown Regions, most Chiss would lose their Force abilities as they grew out of childhood. And this isn't lore here, but I speculate that this could be the result of manipulation by the Celestials. When they altered space-time to cut off the spread of the Nal Nal, these master wielders of the Force may have done something to alter the connection with living beings in this area. Maybe as a way to deprive the all-consuming Grey Ooze of Force-wielding slaves. Though it may have opened the door to some Force abilities that some would consider unnatural, an enemy of the Chiss that we'll talk about later in this video. There is a less intense theory that it may just be the Chiss culture that stunted the expression of this Force connection. Ahsoka points out during her time after Order 66, when seeing a child use the Force, and knowing that the Emperor was hunting down any Force sensitives, that if the child was not trained by a group like the Jedi, these abilities would weaken over time to the point that she could not use them in any detectable way. This might be a good explanation for what's happening here, but the only problem I have with this is that the Chiss had a very good reason to keep around Force users. The way that they explored space in this space-time thicket of gravitational anomalies was to use mostly young female Force wielders as navigators. These children would be pressed into service for the Chiss Ascendancy, and help with the slow and careful journeys out from Scylla. They called this ability the Sight, as their focus was to detect unseen dangers via their precognitive abilities. This sense was called Third Sight, while telepathy was referred to as Second Sight. So while most cultures would rely on a trusty astromech to safely travel the stars, the Chiss Empire was built from the sight of gifted children in the role of navigators. Though most Chiss would never know this, in fact, most were completely ignorant of the Force at all. 
And though it seems odd that Chiss on the main part of the galaxy can be seen becoming Jedi, it is this seemingly unstoppable degeneracy of the young Chiss's force connection that makes me think it may be built into this area of space, something the Celestials did to prevent the Nal Nal plague from using the force. As the Chiss military had every reason to develop the force abilities of their children, keeping a lifetime of navigator experience instead of always churning through new kids, training them all the way up from scratch each time to just serve a few years. But to make it even weirder, as the Force would choose to immaculately conceive the Chosen One via a woman named Skywalker, the Chiss independently chose to name these beings with the gift of sight, these navigators of the stars, Ozili Ashembo, a Chiun word that means Skywalker. And so these Skywalkers were key to the power of the Chiss Ascendancy. The Ascendancy was the name of their empire, which would come to conquer the homeworlds of several other species, as well as plant Chiss colonies on a number of lifeless worlds. It was ruled by the nine ruling families, the leaders each being called Aristocra. It should be noted that some later researchers during the New Republic era believe that these ruling families came to power after winning a civil war during that dramatic climate shift when Scylla was entering its Ice Age, a war that saw about half of the population eliminated. And though nothing in Chiss history mentions this, the Chiss are extremely secretive about their past forbidding outsiders from seeing their accounts, while admitting to having detailed records over tens of thousands of years, but no one but the ruling families can access them. There was at least a superficial democracy, with an elected parliamentary body from each of their 28 colonies. But the next step were governors appointed by the nine families, and so those governors acted as gatekeepers, as they were the only ones to pass on legislation to the rulers. Each of the nine houses would deal with different issues, such as justice, education, healthcare, science, and military. Because their society was a collectivist economy, House Sapla, the family in charge of logistics and redistribution of resources, became the de facto head of the Chiss civilization, with House Nerodu, the head of warfare, being a close second. When they met to make a decision, they tried to never use individual names, instead each wearing colored robes to distinguish each house a practice that made the family seem timeless. No exceptionally great or exceptionally weak individual that would stand out in history. And while we're talking about names, the Chiss have a three-part naming system. The first was their family name, while the second was their personal name, and the third was their occupation. Or if they were a member of those nine larger families, the third one would be that overname since it was almost always also your individual occupation. But these names could change over your lifetime based on major changes to your status. Thrawn's original birth name was Kaivu Ra Nuru, being named Ra and of the relatively small and poor colony family named Kaivu. When he rose through the ranks of the Chiss Military Academy, a man named Myth Urf Ianiko noticed the boy's genius and took him as a merit adoptive. One of the only ways for a Chiss to ascend out of this authoritative socialistic caste system, where he would go on to serve the military branch or House Nurodu. His name was now Myth Ra Nurodu. As the Chiss Expansionary Defense Force consolidated their strength in the unknown regions, they established alliances and lucrative trade networks with numerous species from countless worlds. With these people, they would speak the language Minisayat or Saibisti, trade languages that had been developed in the unknown regions that could be produced by almost all species, as their native language Shiyun had syllables that were unpronounceable even by their human cousins. The first humans they met were the most remote of settlers on the fringes of the Outer Rim, Life always has a way of breaking through boundaries, and some were able to trickle through the celestial-imposed hyperspace thicket over millennia, having a handful of Chiss popping up on both the sides of the Old Republic and Sith Empire. But considering what we know of Thrawn's role with the Empire, I think it should be considered that many, if not all, were acting as double agents for the Chiss Ascendancy. With characters like the Chiss Jedi Nuru Kungurama, who conveniently dropped his Nurodu last name, and who, like Thrawn, was also serendipitously discovered by the Republic. While Thrawn was placed in exile to be discovered by the Empire, and to work his way up through the ranks of the military, Arama was picked up by the Jedi and rose through their ranks. Odd that such a series of events would happen on their own when it was already extremely rare for Chiss males to be Force-sensitive. I think this was the work of the invisible hand of the Chiss Ascendancy, the ruling family that had learned from this abrupt bisection of the galaxy and the sudden onset of an Ice Age, that they needed to collect as much information as possible, always trying to understand all the variables in the galaxy at large to make sure they weren't blindsided again. 
a sentiment that leads to the stereotypical Chiss being defined by incredible self-control, intelligence, and a cold reasoning that planned out decades into the future. As they expanded their federation of planets, they also used automated drones to create a network of anchor points, similar to hyperspace buoys, but that could be used only by Chiss craft, with a fleet that was the closest thing out there to the strength of the Republic, with everything from carriers, destroyers, fighters and bombers, APCs and gunboats, with their troops possessing the most advanced tech in the region, like a cloaking armor device and Charic weapons. A weapon that was a sort of combination of slug rifle and blaster, combining a solid projectile sent along a beam of blue energy, compromising most shields or armor, which were only suited to block solids or beams, not both. And that could not be deflected by lightsabers. This is also the same type of weapon that made the Chiss capital ship's equivalent of a turbolaser, called the Mega Mazer Artillery. So imagine just how devastating that would be on ships like a Venator or an ISD. The Chiss pride themselves on an appearance of cold logic and peacekeeping, avoiding any conflict, which is their true goal, but only on their terms. Every species that dealt with them felt an aggravating air of superiority coming off the Chiss, and in private, this was truly how the Chiss felt, that they were the stewards of the galaxy, especially in the unknown regions, the only society of adults surrounded by all these other species that acted like careless, aimless children and they went through great effort to make sure accounts of any conflicts were hidden. The Chiss would use biological weapons like a parasite bomb, as well as things like radiation bombs and the Chiss defoliator, all in an effort to bring worlds into line with the goal of the Chiss ascendancy. Instead of the major conflicts like those that consume the galaxy at large about every century, the Chiss went thousands of years without open conflict, due to the surgical precision of their special forces and also a ton of espionage. Long ago, Chiss agents stole a hollow map from the Sith Emperor in case our deal with the Empire went sour. It shows the coordinates to the Emperor's greatest secrets. Officially, we can't act on this. But you can. If you disposed of Zenta, you would have the gratitude of the Ascendancy. I may even be able to broker an alliance. Look forward to our partnership, Aristocra. The Ascendancy thanks you. By around 4000 BBY, we see multiple Chiss in the service of the Old Republic and Sith Empire, as mentioned earlier with individuals like Thrawn and Kungarama, who infiltrated the Empire and Jedi Order. When the Old Sith Empire tried to conquer the Chiss, they gave up without a fight, seemingly to be resigned to the role of a vassal state. They traded goods and even offered up military advisors and equipment, all in exchange for being able to retain their autonomy. Knowing how powerful the Chiss actually were, and how nearly impossible it would be for the Sith to maintain a campaign against Ascendancy space, with that hyperspace thicket being worse than Russian winters, I think it's reasonable to assume that the Chiss wanted to give aid to the Sith Empire. The Empire was essentially demanding to have Chiss spies in their midst, and to use Chiss technology against their rival superpower, the Republic. What better way to learn about these two superpowers outside the unknown regions? and proof that the Chiss were not at all conquered was in Zero Station on the planet Hoth. Somehow, they were able to keep the location of this base a secret even from their Sith allies, though they did put it to work to provide intel alongside other Sith installations on this icy world. This is a top secret Chiss Ascendancy installation. Self-sufficient, running in parallel with the above ground outposts. Paranoia at work. But our paranoia paid off. So again, we see that even others were aware of just how cautious the Chiss people were. The psychological and cultural remnant of those unforeseen disasters that formed their species tens of thousands of years ago. If you noticed, the only Chiss that other species are meeting are either those that were serendipitously discovered, or military representatives sent out from the CEDF. And as you should expect with this species, this was of course by design. Even within the unknown region, no one has ever had direct contact with Chiss civilians. At least no one that ever survived or documented it. This was a combination of their view of cultural superiority, but also just another layer of precautions. As the military was an incredibly well-refined machine, with each and every action approved by the Council of Superiors, every interaction the Chiss had with an alien species was according to their plans. They could not risk the billions of variables that would enter the calculations if civilians were engaging outsiders, getting in feuds or romances that could drag them into a whole web of alliances that the Historicas could not control. 
By the year 1000 BBY, Lord Khan's Brotherhood of Darkness discovered a group of Chiss in the Unknown Regions, and were able to convince a legion of them to join their forces on the planet Thule. Again, likely they were spies trying to learn about this new Sith force. And this is the first time that outsiders would hear of the Chiss policy of avoiding initiating aggression or any form of preemptive strikes. Though it should be noted that throughout Chiss history, just entering into Chiss space was seen as an act of aggression, and some within the military approved strikes against any violating vessel. From the year 178 up to 28 BBY, the Chiss were starting to be introduced to the greatest threat in millennia. Though this is a spot where legends and canon will differ in details like names and dates, but notice in their core, these are very similar threats. Legends say that a race considered to be simple barbarians, the Vagari, seemingly out of nowhere, were becoming more aggressive, and were raiding closer and closer to the Ascendancy's borders. This was the first sign of the coming invasion of the Yuzon Vong, the extragalactic force that would conquer the entire galaxy in years to come. These invaders had forced the barbarians to flee towards Chiss space, and it also forced the living, sentient planet Zenoma Sekot to also escape into this space. The CEDF was quick to inspect it, but assumed it was just a strange, rogue planet caught in some gravitational current. In 27 BBY, a Jedi exploration force was traveling into the unknown regions. Six dreadnought cruisers arrived in a mission deemed the Outbound Flight. This sharp increase in activity in their quiet part of the galaxy concerned a young officer, Thrawn. While his superiors were working on the construction of an enormous fortress installation with hopes to defend Ascendancy space, Thrawn urged them to abandon the policy that forbid preemptive strikes. They refused, but when his fleet was discovered by a Trade Federation vessel that was trying to engage the outbound flight, he took the battle to the alien forces, eliminating the vastly greater force through his remarkable tactics. He ordered the Trade Federation flagship to be kept intact, and boarded their strange vessel, where he would meet with a close associate of Darth Sidious. The robed figure explained over a hollow that he was aware of the Yuzon Vong threat, something that was so great that it would require an incredibly powerful, unified, galactic military to oppose it. Sidious was currently working towards that goal, and was impressed with Thrawn's ability to take down this larger Federation force. Thrawn understood that he was acting in the spirit of preservation of his species, the Chiss' identity to take up the mantle of stewardship of the galaxy by being a strong enough force to face the evils spawned up by this cruel universe. While his descendants nearly died off, caught in the crossfire in the war between the Nal Nal and the Celestials, he would not let his Chiss go extinct in this inevitable conflict with the Vong and this Darth Sidious. He would draw the nearby Vagari force towards the location of the Jedi ship, and wait until both had been significantly weakened before rushing in to finish them both off. Nearly 50,000 Republic personnel were killed, but the Jedi back on Coruscant never knew the details, expecting that Outbound Flight's mission to explore the unknown regions only ever had a very slim chance of success, assuming that they were likely destroyed by these space-time anomalies. Before this rejection of their non-aggression policy, Thrawn was exiled whereupon he would be discovered by the Empire and eventually rise through the ranks, Sidious remembering this competent, blue-skinned alien. While during the Clone Wars, this was along the time that Kungarama was discovered by the Republic and raised in the Jedi Order, and Sev Ron's Tan claimed to be abandoned by her people and intended to become a Sith Lord, finding her way to Count Dooku to become one of his dark acolytes and even a general of a droid army. And her lover was becoming a prominent bounty hunter. Again, we can't confirm that they were all spies, but notice that the Ascendancy would have infiltrated the Republic slash Imperial military, Count Dooku's acolytes and CIS military, as well as the criminal underworld. Thrawn would stay in a secret but powerful position within the Empire, appointed to his role by Sidious personally, and he used Imperial might to ensure that threats to the Ascendancy were eliminated, eventually even becoming Emperor himself of the Imperial Remnant forces. Though he would be assassinated before the Yuzon Vong invasion, his people were now taking the threat seriously, and becoming more proactive than ever to establish alliances with obscure forces like the Hapes Consortium, and major forces like the New Republic, and some remnant factions. Together, they were able to stop this all-consuming, galactic-scale threat. This time would also see Jedi Master Luke Skywalker meeting with these people as an emissary of the Galactic Alliance. 
On Scylla, Master Skywalker would also glimpse something that the ruling families had desperately tried to conceal. The ugly fact that their seemingly cold and logical leadership was also witness to some vicious assassinations, even of members of rival ruling families. The last time we hear of the Chiss and Legends is around 127 years after the Battle of Yavin, when they were at their old trick of letting themselves seem to bend the knee to a Sith Empire, while having their agents take on important roles in Darth Krayt's Empire. In canon, there are some important differences. Thrawn wasn't really exiled. This was all an elaborate ruse to get the Empire to take Thrawn in, as he had previously fought alongside Anakin Skywalker during a time in the Clone Wars. Though their battle was not against the CIS, it would be Nymoidians that ended up getting the Chiss reinvested in the galaxy at large. When Thrawn was working with Jedi Knight Skywalker, the details he got concerning the Republic left the Chiss man disappointed. He felt the Republic was an unworthy ally. The Ascendancy had been aware of a looming threat from the parts of the Unknown Regions that even they had been unable to map. The Grisk were violent conquerors, with fleets of enormous size that were said to block out the stars of systems that they invaded, through means that are still not fully understood, but most likely some sort of novel force ability, they were able to employ a sort of mind control over their victims, deeming them client species and using them as their next wave of frontline soldiers and workers snowballing their forces throughout the Unknown Regions. They were the only serious threat to the Chiss Ascendancy in thousands of years. And though their violence was what spread their infamy, Thrawn and many Chiss military intelligence officers noticed the Grisk's incredible planning and surveillance. The mysterious force was not plundering at random, but targeting blaster and lightsaber-resistant materials like Cortosis, while also having a deeper understanding of Chiss society than any other species in this region. At this time, Thrawn would be approached by Nymordians that were fleeing the abrupt collapse of the CIS, knowing the punishment by Palpatine's new empire would be swift and deadly. They begged Thrawn to convince the Ascendancy to rally up the fractured and fleeing CIS forces, to rush back and topple this evil empire. But unlike with the Republic, Thrawn liked the description of the empire, a force that had unified the galaxy, was ruled by a strong dictator that was bent on expanding the military, which had already proved to be incredibly powerful. Nothing to bog down the decision making, no anti-war factions that might have a say in the government, this was exactly the ally the Ascendancy was looking for. So they agreed that Thrawn would fake his exile, be captured by Imperial forces, and use his proficiency against these imps along with his connection to Anakin Skywalker to open the door to a low-ranking position in the Imperial military. Thrawn would be just the latest of Chiss double agents, something Palpatine was not entirely unaware of. But the Blue Alien's tactics proved themselves time and time again, allowing him to rise through the ranks and eventually become Grand Admiral Thrawn. He would nearly put an end to the Rebel Alliance during the Battle of Adalon, but immediately after this, Thrawn and Darth Vader would recall to Coruscant to meet with the Emperor, who explained that he had felt a disturbance in the Force somewhere in the Unknown Regions. This investigation would be the way that the Empire learned of the Grisk. Thrawn's Star Destroyer, the Chimera, would engage a fleet of Grisk, and it was only from using the new TIE Defender that they were able to eke out a victory. A skirmish that showed just how closely the Grisk had been studying everything, having excellent counters to TIE fighters and interceptors. They hadn't just been spying on the Chiss, but even the Humans' Empire. And with all that the Chiss' ascendancy had learned of these people, Thrawn knew this was not a true victory, saying, quote, The Grisk are not to be underestimated. If they fled combat today, it is because they chose to do so. Thrawn also learned about how the Grisk had been infiltrating the ascendancy through means of political subversion. For the first time in history, at least within the records allowed to be viewed by those of Thrawn's level, one of the populations under Chiss' rule was being manipulated by an outside force. The Chiss were laying the seeds of disagreement within the ruling families. These people were an alien virus that emerged from the depths of the unknown regions that now might lead to a civil war within the Ascendancy, and one which eventually would spread to challenge the Empire as well. After another skirmish, this time over the planet Batu within the Western Reaches, Thrawn could read the writing on the wall. He knew his people would have to act as a bulwark against the Grisk, saying to Vader, quote, The invasion is coming, Lord Vader, but I have now bought the Empire time to prepare. Thrawn believed that this species posed an existential threat to life in the galaxy. All might become mind-controlled slaves to the Grisk, and he knew that this fight might mean the end of his civilization, but that the Chiss species' only hope for survival was to build up this strong empire on the other side of the rift. 
a rift that separated these blue-skinned, red-eyed people from their distant human cousins. These peoples, a Chis-led empire and a human-led empire, would have to unify in this inevitable battle. So that's it for the story of the Chis species, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. I just want to explain this again just in case it was a bit confusing, but the force-sensitive navigators that the Chis used allows you to travel through the maze of space-time anomalies quicker. I worry people might have been confused how there was any travel past the rift caused by the Celestials, but it wasn't that it was impossible, just incredibly complicated. For example, the Skywalkers, or Ozili Ashembo, cut travel time from what should be months down to just days or even hours. So it could be done by others, it would just take an incredibly long time. So that's how some merchants on the most outer regions of the Outer Rim occasionally dared to explore these regions and how other species came in and out of this region over millennia. This concept of supernatural navigators is similar to the guild navigators in the Dune universe. The psychoactive drug Spice gives them mental powers that aid in space travel. The Chiss species was first introduced through Thrawn in the novel Heir to the Empire back in 1991. The idea that their force powers diminished as they enter adulthood is a new canon concept, but there were always only very few Chiss force wielders. Only the Dark Acolyte under Dooku, Severance Tan, and three Jedi, Antaria Wellos, Kung Arama Nurodu, and Daz Ranos. An early design of Agent Kallus shows that he could have been a Chiss, but I agree with the Rebels team that this might have been a bit much. The fact that Thrawn was a Chiss that rose so high in the Empire, and was the only one we see, really adds to his mystery. I think it would have been odd if there was another Chiss in the story of the Rebel series. Author Timothy Zahn says that on top of the already four new canon books made revolving around Thrawn, he hopes to be able to expand more on the Grisk invasion in future material. And one of the coolest attentions to the lore was in the game Jedi Outcast, when Kyle Katarn meets a Chiss bartender on the world Nar Shada, and we can see that he's struggling with Galactic Basic, as the Chiss native tongue is very different. Pears, out of sight, out of minds, says us. And it's all strictly legit, right? As legitimate as anything on Nar Shada. And then there's also Iram Radik from the novel Maul Lockdown. Radik was a weapons designer that operated from within the most notorious prison in the galaxy, Coghive 7. Eleven years before the Clone Wars, Sidious sent Maul in with the goal of identifying this mysterious figure, who was revealed to be so powerful that he had his hands on a nuclear device. And this is a bit of my own insight on this, not strictly lore, but almost every Chiss can be seen as spying on the society from the other side of the rift. Notice that the Chiss we see in the galaxy at large are always at extreme ends of society. A respected Imperial Admiral, a Jedi or Sith, and criminals. I see it like this. The Chiss Ascendancy wanted to see how strong those powers are, learn their operations firsthand, but also see the weaknesses of those powers. How strong are the Jedi and Sith really? How about the Republic and Empire? How much disorder or corruption is there? That side is tested via the various bounty hunters we see over time, and beings like that bartender, which might not seem like much, but he's soaking up stories from all of the criminals that poured through the cantinas of the crime capital of the galaxy. A perfect way to get the story from that end. Or infiltrating the most secret prison facility and trying to arm various groups like the Bando Gora. How long could you get away with that? Painting a fuller picture of the state of affairs, as they're collecting information on the success or failure of bribes, is the Empire cracking down harder, or is crime booming, and maybe that strong dictatorship was just an illusion? The best way to find out is to have ears in the Republic slash Empire, but also within the criminal world. Exactly what you'd expect from the species that managed to claw out their own Empire in a part of the galaxy that was sacrificed and cut off. A people shocked by unpredictable events, that from then on out were driven to gather the most data available to understand all the variables at play, in order to bring about their ascendancy. So that's it for the Chiss species. The best way to show your support is to hit that like button and drop a comment. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And of course subscribe if you want to see more. We have tons of other species videos like the Degruta and Tusken Raiders, and all kinds of ship breakdowns and character stories. You can find links in the description below, alongside affiliate links to cool stuff like awesome metal print art and free audible audiobooks. There you can also find links to our Patreon and PayPal. Special thanks to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Cas Costello, C7Go, and Matthew Beltrami. But most important of all, remember, the Chiss are always watching. So don't let down the human race by letting your search results scare away potential alien allies. And the Force will be with you, always.